So, um, I need to ask you some questions because I don't know where to go at this point as far as as uh, what you've done in the past. It's it's kind of funny. I was just sitting here listening to some of the words being thrown around, and you're saying PCA, and you're saying eigenvalues, and and so so my question is at this point, we're going to start to use a lot of that stuff in here, all right? So I could spend some time going over some basics of matrix algebra and linear algebra. Is that worth doing? Is that is worth doing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we talked a little bit last time about statistics and multivariate statistics, and nobody nobody uh, jumped up and down and said I've already done multivariate statistics. Um, so I can do I can do a review of the univariate lead up to multivariate statistics, and we'll go over that and add something. It's still good to see. I don't want to I don't want to repeat too much of what you've already seen. All right, good. All right, so that'll that'll uh, that'll make this easy. All right, so what I want to do also is I want to go off the set of uh, materials that are in the textbook a little bit because I think I can do a, a little better uh, presentation of this stuff to you with some other materials that I already have. So just to let everybody know, if you go to um, you the course webpage and you hit the courses over here, um, 1051782 is the class that if you're taking image processing next quarter, that's the class that you'll, you'll follow my table with. Um, I've, I've done that, you know, probably for the past five or so years. Um, I won't be doing it this year, but I want to use some of the materials that I have prepped in that class um, to do some of the things that we're going to do in here. It's because I think they're 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 easier for me to follow along. As I come um, so if you go over to that class, I mean, everything looks pretty much the same, but it is different. Um, under the course notes section, there's a uh, click here to download slide used in the class. And I just, I broke it up by sessions, you know, just much the way we did in here. And sessions, let's see, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are going to cover a lot of the same material um, that we're going to do in here. So if Maria Helguera um, follows a similar format and you're taking image processing next quarter, you'll probably see some of this material again. And that's always the case. The folks who had remote sensing in the winter always had seen some of the stuff that we were doing there. But remember, that's going to be for the larger one. So, we'll see it twice. We'll be really good at it. So, so 14, 15, 16, and 17 um, are the ones to go ahead and download. Right. Now, at the end of class today, Monica's going to come in and introduce the next laboratory um, for everybody. And, uh, and you know, she'll talk about all the mechanics, what needs to happen there. And we just set a due date on the 21st, which is Tuesday of the last week of the classes. Your question? There are three more courses, advanced courses for image processing. There are, I'm sorry, what? I, I saw that there is image processing one, two, and three. There are three those more are the courses. Those are the undergraduate classes. Ah, undergraduate. Yeah, undergraduate, we have three, a full year sequence. So I will let her talk about that stuff at the end. So let's um let's dive into the new stuff here. So so why are we what what's our next step here? Well, the next step is going to be to do a very traditional um, remote sensing sort of task, which is is what is usually referred to as land cover classification. Okay, the generic term um, that's used for this because you know back in the you know, the early 1970s when the first um, satellites started to be put up by NASA for um, observation of the Earth as a whole. Right? We put up the Landsat series uh, began at that time, so Landsats 1 through 7 um, have come and gone. Landsats 4, no, I'm sorry, Landsats 5 and 7 are still in orbit. Landsat 4, I don't think it's functioning any longer. I don't think it's come down, but I don't think it, the sensor set it down, down any longer. But 5 and 7 are up there. 8 is due to launch. I think this year, if everything stays on schedule. Um, so we'll have another um, instrument up there uh, this year. And, and these were, um, at first they were four-band systems. We talked about the Landsat MSS back when we were talking about different architectures. And that was a four-band system, red, green, blue, and near infrared. 
And then when Landsat 5 was launched, or Landsat 4, I'm sorry, was launched, they put a new sensor on there called the Thematic Mapper, which was a seven band system. Um, it added two additional bands in the shortwave infrared region of the spectrum, so out around um, you know, about 1.1, now about 1.5 out to about two and a half microns. They split that region into two bands. And then they added an additional band in the, um, the long wave infrared region of the spectrum from 10.4 to 12.5 microns. Um, and that was the first thermal uh, system that we had in the space. Now, that's carried through. The uh, Landsat 8 has a couple additional bands proposed uh, on it. So, but, but it's still in the neighborhood of, you know, like 10 bands or, or so. so. So we're not talking hyperspectral systems by any means. Um, but we're talking about selected bands to really enable us to look at the Earth and classify land cover types, hence Landsat, right? So, so the bands have been used for all kind of other things, but they were primarily picked because of um, the need to do land cover classification. All right, so now all the techniques that we're going to go over here are not specific to land cover classification at all. I mean, the techniques that we're going to use called you know, minimum distance to mean, parallel pipette classification, Gaussian maximum likelihood classification, spectral angle mapper, all these things which we'll go over in the next couple days here are applicable to all kinds of data sets. Right? It doesn't matter what you're working in, if you're doing you know, astronomy, if you're trying to, to classify gases, we've used these same techniques for astronomy applications. If you're doing medical imaging and you're trying to, to diagnose um, you know, certain uh, tissues that are, are diseased in one way or another, we've used the, exactly these same sorts of, of algorithms. Um, they grew up in the remote sensing community, but all these other communities have adopted them. So the math won't change, SAP doesn't change, you know, it's just, it's just the application that's applied. It changes. All right. Okay, so, I don't want to insult anybody. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to boss over anything either. So. I'll, I'll move quickly through this. If we get to something that doesn't make sense, um, you know, let's slow down and take a little bit closer. All right, so you know, just real rudimentary um, review of vector algebra. Typically, when we have multispectral or hyperspectral data, we refer to a pixel now as having not only a digital count, as you would in a grayscale in a digital image, or a three vector, as you would in a color image, but now we have an n vector, which is the number of bands, right? We usually represent that as a column vector, okay? Um, and most of the equations that we'll see assume that if you have a single observation of a single pixel, its bands, x1, x2, through xl in this case, are arranged in a column vector, right? Uh, like the, the matrix dimensions all work out for us. All right, well, obviously, if you, uh, if you have a vector, you can multiply that vector by a constant, just multiplies all its elements. You can add vectors together by adding their elements. All right, so, so why was it important to show this and not show you that you multiply vectors? I don't know, maybe that was harder to write out. But, but you know, so, so let me just make clear. Everybody knows how to multiply vectors? Everybody knows what a determinant of a vector is? Why is a determinant of a vector useful? Being in body. What's that? Define being in body. Um, and just see if you, if you could use it. Or you mm -hmm. could use it to find uh, um, eigenvalues. You could use it to find inverses. Absolutely. Are you talking about the determinant of a matrix? Or the yeah. Of a determinant of a matrix. Right. Tells you whether or not that matrix is singular. Okay. Right. Or, or linear, linearly independent. All right. Um, so let's get onto that topic for a second, the, the concept of, of linear dependency in vectors. If, if I have a set of vectors, x1, x2, xk, okay, so these are all individual vectors, if I can come up with some set of non-zero coefficients to multiply those by, and I can add them together and they add up to zero, that means that at least two of those vectors are linear dependent on one. Um, I could add or I could multiply a vector as we did on the last slide by a constant and the product of that is a linear dependency. 
right? So in other words, if I have a vector one, two, three, and a vector uh, two, four, six, essentially the first vector multiplied by two, they point in the same direction, right? They're linear dependent on one another, right? And the same thing if I have the sum of, of two vectors, I can add two vectors together, and uh, x of i here on the left hand side would be a linear dependent vector on either one on the right hand side. All right. Um, you can have a vector x that can be expressed as a linear combination of, of these other vectors called basis vectors. Okay. Uh, I didn't mention that here. Uh, if I do have a set of linear dependent vectors, any linear dependent set of vectors is referred to as a basis set for that vector set. All right, so what, what does that mean? All right, so let's just, let's just hop over here to a diagram for a second, because I think this really, really points it out. If I have two vectors here, uh, two unit vectors, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, right, I can plot that. This one's 1, 0, 0. This one's uh, 0, 1, 0, T1, T2. I could perform some linear combination of, of um, Q1 and Q2 by multiplying them by some constant. And I can wind up with another vector in space. Here it's here it's C. Right? So I could multiply this vector by some constant, this vector by some constant. I can come up with this as a sum. Right? But the key here is that these vectors, um, this one is in the xy plane, this one is in the xy plane. Their sum is also going to be in that xy plane. Right? And you know, so what what does that mean? Well, it means that this xy plane contains those three vectors are all in that same three space, right? They all fall in the same plane in that three space, right? And so for a three vector, as I have here, um, all my vectors that are linear combinations are going to fall in the same plane. As I go to higher order dimensions, you know, greater than three, the same concept still holds true, only it's a little harder to illustrate, right? But they fall in what, what we'll refer to from this point, you know, for a lot of stuff that we do in this class, is a hyperplane, okay. some plane at a higher dimension. All right. So, at that point, I'm going to hop over to the slides from the other class. All right. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to do a lot, you know, just with simple vector algebra, and I think, I think we're all set to do that at this point. But as we move on a little bit more, um, we're going to start to talk about the data sets themselves, right? The, the, the fact that if we have multispectral or hyperspectral data, um, there's a certain characteristic about this kind of data that um, really needs taken care of or dealt with in some way before we can go on and, and use it very effectively. And that is the fact that the data itself is very redundant, right? So for instance, if, if you took a, a picture with your, your digital camera and you formed an RGB image, and you took every pixel in that scene in the blue band, and you plotted the digital count in the blue band versus the digital count in the green band for every pixel. Right, so you made a plot, um, the y-axis was green digital count, and the x-axis was blue digital count. And you, for every pixel, you just plotted that, that um, blue-green pair. What do you think that plot would look like? It's, it, you know, it, at first you might say, well, it's blue versus green. It should just be a random scatter out there. And um, that's really not the case 
in the world. I mean, if you look around and you look in this room, you know, just look, look around this room, it's a very boringly painted room, right? I mean, there's white walls, there's gray panels on there, and there's a white screen. Um, well, there's carpet down here that's some color. <laughs> um, right? but, but actually, if you think, all right, look at this white screen. If I ask you what the blue and the green digital count, what are they? They're the same. White wall? Gray panels? This blue-green carpet? <laughs> Probably the same, right? So if I were to plot a picture of this room in that way, blue versus green, you're going to see something very close to a line, a very highly correlated data set. So the question comes down, if it's highly correlated, do I need both bands? Do I need the blue and the green data? Right? And as we get higher order dimension data, that question becomes even more important because let's say, let's jump to the other extreme where we have hyperspectral. And from 0.4 to 2.7, so let's just go over the visible part of the spectrum, that's um, 300 nanometers. Yeah, 300 nanometers, right? So if we went 10 nanometer increments, we could have uh, 30 bands across there. So now think about, if, let's say they're in order, going from blue to red. If you had band one and band two, do you think that that data is going to be correlated? You're talking, you know, 400 microns and 410 microns, or, uh, nanometers. I'm sorry. Right? They're probably going to be highly correlated. And 410 is probably going to be highly correlated with 420, and, and so on. If you look at adjacent bands, you're probably going to get very highly correlated data. All right. Now, if I can um, come up with an algorithm that depends on that data to do land cover classification. Well, I want lots of information, but if I use the data as it is, just the raw digital counts from red, green, blue, or, or from the hyperspectral uh, suite of, of bands that we just talked about, um, I could be using a lot of data, but I may not have a lot of information because the data is redundant. So, okay. so we're going to look at how we decorrelate that data. Right? We're going to use something that you, you just mentioned earlier, PCA, or principal components analysis to do that. It's a, it's a transformation based on eigenvectors and then eigenvalues. All right? and it, it tries to rearrange our data set in such a way so that the correlation goes away. The advantageous part of that, that we'll see in the end, is that let's say I had 30 bands that went from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, and, and they're all very highly correlated with one another. After performing a transformation to remove that correlation, it may turn out that two or three of those 30 bands might contain 95% or more of the information that's in the data. So I might be able to reduce my data space down from 30 down to three and, and still maintain you know, some very high percentage of the total information that's in there. Right? So that's, that's where we'll, we'll move to um, a little later on after we talk about classification on straight digital count data. Um, we can move to look at some of that stuff. But as far as the, the background materials for that, um, the ability to compute those eigenvectors that we'll use as our transformation coefficients is, is a critical part of that. All right, so some of the terminology that we'll wind up using uh, later on is we'll refer to something called an orthogonal matrix. Okay? And you know, just as the definition of rows of orthogonal matrix or what's called an orthonormal basis. Right? What does that mean? It means that there's some um, set of vectors uh, that are what? Well, the ortho, or I'm sorry, the normal part of it implies that each of those vectors is going to be a normal vector or a unit vector. And so it'll be normalized. And the ortho part of that means that those vectors will be mutually perpendicular. So if we think about an RGB space, if we plotted it on, you know, in a Cartesian uh, coordinate system, red, green, and blue are orthogonal to one another, right? They form three axes. Okay. Um, and we can normalize those so that any RGB vector was um, was a unit length, okay? And then that could form an orthogonal basis. So that's really all an orthonormal, or an orthogonal, uh, I'm sorry, an orthonormal matrix is. Now, 
the columns of an orthonormal basis are all, also form an orthonormal basis. So if you look at the columns or the rows of that matrix, they're both orthonormal to one another. Um, that, that gives us some very nice uh, behavior a little later on when we're trying to do some computation that helps us speed up some things. And uh, all right, so now, what's the, what's the concept here of an orthogonal matrix? You heard that term before? What is, what is that? Well, well that's, 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 that falls out <laughs> <laughs> later on. <laughs> but what, what is an orthogonal matrix in itself? Meaning, what does that mean? That they, they are all mutually perpendicular, right? Yeah. So the same thing as an orthonormal, except that it's not necessarily normalized. Mm -hmm. All right. So you'll see here this terminology thrown around, and it all means the same thing. All right. The orthonormal is just a normalized version of the orthogonal. So now it does have a very nice property. All right. That the transpose is the inverse of that matrix. All right. So so computationally we can save ourselves a lot of time um, in two ways. It's a lot easier to compute the transpose of the matrix um, than it is to compute the inverse of that matrix. And it has that great feature that it is always invertible, so we never even need to worry about checking if that matrix is going to be invertible before we begin. We know by definition it is invertible. All right, so let's talk about this concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And and if you have a dim, because do you have a dim test coming up that has this on there? All right. So what I'm going to say in here stays in here, right? unless it helps you. If you're going to have a, a, a test in uh, in um, in dim, please use all the definitions that you've been learning in dim. All right. But these these are I'll say the very practical definitions of what, what we're going to be doing. All right. So the question is: Is there a vector x? Right? That can be multiplied by a number, a scalar, lambda, and be transformed in exactly the same way as if that vector x had been multiplied by a matrix m. Right? It sounds like just a riddle that you might ask to your, your classmate when you're in third grade, right? <laughs> and there's, there's no funny punchline here. But the answer becomes yes, right? That we could come up with this equation right here. That we can have some matrix m multiplied by a vector x that will give us identically the same answer as taking that original matrix X and multiplying it by a scale. All right, so what's this imply? It implies that if we take the difference between those two things, we'll get zero. We can factor out that vector X. What did I do to do that? Well, to keep this scalar lambda matrix, I just put in an identity matrix of the same dimension. Okay. All right, this can be true under two cases, right? This can be true if, if X, the vector itself, is zero, okay? Or if the determinant of that difference winds up being zero. Okay. So going back to, to what you just said earlier, we can use the determinant to figure out the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors. All right. So let's assume that this is the boring case, right? X equals zero. We're not going to come across that all too often. Um, and then let's go ahead and, and solve. So if the latter case here, the determinant of the difference between uh, that matrix M and lambda times the identity, if that determinant equals zero, um, lambda is going to be what we call the eigenvalues of M, that matrix. And X is going to be a matrix, if we put that back in and compute what X would be, um, that contains the eigenvectors. All right, so if you, if you have this transformation, y equals n times x, and we're going to use that transformation over and over again, x is going to be the digital count vector that we record with our sensor. y is going to be some other representation of it. All right? And in fact, if m turns out to be the eigenvectors of what's called the covariance matrix of our data, then y will be the principal components transform data set. Right? So taking x, our original wavelength data, and transforming it through 
uh, a matrix composed of the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, what that will give us is just linear transformation, right? where y is now a transformed version of our original wavelength-based data. It contains all the same information, right? but it just packages it differently. It packages it in a way that the individual um, components of this vector are now linearly independent from one another. And what that gives us, it gives us a way to reduce the amount of data that we need to use and still carry the same amount of information. You'll see, as I go through some of the slides from the image processing class, that the, the title on there, which you should probably just ignore for now, is spectral data compression, right? Um, You'll learn a lot more about image compression uh, next quarter in image processing. And part of that is trying to reduce redundancy in data sets. And, and one of the ways that you reduce it in hyperspectral data sets is to reduce the spectral redundancy by transforming the original data set through a transform very similar to this. All right, little, little side note. Um, I just found this out last week. And uh, it, it's kind of a neat opportunity. I don't know if anybody has room in their schedule. Um, if anybody sees themselves, you know, really interested in image processing, and particularly if you're very interested in image compression, right? If you, if you can see yourself doing that in the future, or you've done it in the past, and you want to learn more about it, electrical engineering next quarter is offering a course called um, image image and video compression, and it's being taught by Majid Rabani. Um, Majid is is the um, he's pretty much the chief scientist at Kodak Research Labs, but he also headed up the International Standards Committee on JPEG and on MPEG. There's nobody better <laughs> if you want to learn about image compression stuff than to take that class from him. He, uh, I, I've, I've been in a lot of lectures with him, and he is, he is fantastic um, as far as lecture goes, and he knows this stuff you know, inside and out. So he has, he has a class, I think he has it limited to eight students um, over there, but I'm sure he would open it up on a larger kind of folks are interested. So if anybody is interested in that area, definitely someone to to go through the video compression standards, as so MPEG uh, 1, 2, 4, and, uh, and then JPEG and JPEG 2000. And that looks like it's curriculum for the whole quarter. So you'll, you'll get a very deep understanding of all those things if you are into that kind of stuff. All right, so back in here. All right, so now, um, if, if, I could have, if you consider that transformation, that's what we eventually would like to get to, and we'll, we'll figure out why um, in, in, like I said, a couple days here. Um, then as previously defined, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of M are, are given in this way, right? The eigenvalues for I equals one to N, where uh, I is the, uh, or N is the number of bands that we have in our data set, right? So we're, we'll have an eigenvalue for each uh, band in our data set, and we'll have a matrix, like I said, um, of those eigenvalues. All right, so, if you have each of those eigenvalues, and you can multiply them by each of the individual vectors in our original data set, right? this is that equation that we were trying to get to earlier. And I multiply each of those vectors in my original data set times that matrix of eigenvectors, I will get an equality between those two. All right, so these n different equations can be expressed in compact form. You can represent them this way, so you can transform all of the um, data values at a single time. So it's just a matrix representation of that. All right, this um, vector right here, this capital lamp, is that capital lambda? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm hoping that's what it is. All right, capital lambda, or little lambda, um, is, is a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. So it looks like this. So essentially, you're gonna take each of these individual eigenvalues that you would come up with and put them down the major diagonal of that matrix. And you wind up with um, your eigenvalue matrix. Now this is a diagonal matrix, all the off-diagonal terms are zero. Okay. Um, so, so we could rewrite this equation up here that if we had our original data set, um, and we multiply the inverse of that original data set times our matrix of um, eigenvectors, then times the original data set again, we can get back our matrix of eigenvectors. Now, this has 
This has a sort of a, a neat connotation to it, or a definition uh, to it. Each of these individual terms, each of the lambdas, each of the eigenvalues that are in this matrix, what do you know that they represent? The information that you get. Yeah, the information in that, in that particular, in our case, band, right? Um, but now it's not a band in the traditional sense of, hey, it's the data recorded at 410 microns. It's now a band of the transformed version of that data set. All right, so if I go through this transformation that we have up top here, this is my original uh, data for a particular pixel by band. This is the transformed version of that data set. So what do, I, what do I have over here? Well, I have a whole new data set. I have a whole new vector that's some linear form to some linear combination of the original vectors. So this doesn't represent the data at 410 microns anymore, but it's a linear combination of the data at all 30 wavelengths across that visible portion of the spectrum that we referred to earlier. Okay. And each element of that represents a linear combination of all 30 bands in the original data set. So these represent, actually, you know, very simply, the variance of each of those transformed bands. Right? So each of these eigenvalues is the variance of the data in the transformed data space. All right. Now, I don't know, have you seen the concept of a covariance matrix in the past? Yes, in, in BIM? What, what do you use it for in BIM? We talked about it theoretically. We have a study of the Okay. So we just talked about what the element of the of the covariance matrix was and then kind of what they did. All right. So by definition, the covariance matrix, each of these terms in the covariance matrix you can compute this equation right here. And it, it's, it's actually a you know, very simple concept. It is, well, what is variance? Let's go back to the univariate case. What is, what is variance? It's the difference between your data and the mean for all the members of your data set. Square that difference, sum them all up, divide by n minus 1, the members of the data set. Right, that gives you an unbiased uh, measure of the variance. Well, what is that? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's some measure, right? It's the expected value of the average deviation of every data point from the mean squared. Right? So it says how far away is every point in my data set on average from the mean squared. That's what, that's what variance represents. Covariance represents a very similar concept that it reduces down the variance um, in, a, in a very particular case here. It's the difference between every point in the data set and its mean in a particular band. All right, so in this particular case here, I have band K and band L. So this says how far away from the mean of band K is all the data, and at the same time, how far away is the data in band L from that mean. And I'm going to take the product of how far those two things are away from each other. And I'm going to sum them up and divide by n minus 1. Right? If band K and band L are the same band, then this reduces down to variance, right? It's just X in band 1 minus the mean in band 1 times itself. So that's X, so that's, um, X minus the mean squared, right? when the bands are the same. But when the bands are different than one another, it's the average squared distance that these two that this data point is away from the mean in two bands simultaneously. It's the product of those two differences. All right. Now, it turns out that if you normalize that value by dividing by the square root of the product of those two variances that you come up with, right? so these are the two univariate variances. This is the covariance between K and L. This is the univariate variance of K, univariate variance in in L. Okay. If I normalize by the square root of that product, 
this turns out to just be simply the correlation coefficient. So the correlation matrix and the covariance matrix are related. The correlation matrix is just a normalized form of the covariance matrix. And so you can, so the covariance matrix itself can give you some really important information. The diagonal terms are the variance of each of the individual bands or, or data elements that you're looking at. I keep saying bands because that's the context that we'll use it in. So, so sigma sub one is the variance in band one. Sigma sub two is the variance in band two. Sigma sub n is the variance in band n. Sigma sub one two and, the, and sigma two one is the covariance between bands one and two. This will be a symmetric matrix, because okay, it doesn't matter which order you do this product, it will be the same. So those two will be the same. This is the covariance between band one and band n, covariance between band n and band one. Those two will be the same. So if we have data, that has no correlation. And if we have two data sets that have absolutely no correlation with one another, their covariance matrix will reduce down to the univariate variances in each of the individual bands, and all the off diagonal terms will be zero. Okay. Now you may say, hey, you know, that, that's always that idealistic case when we say we have perfect correlation. But in fact, we'll, we'll get here, all right? And we'll get here by going back to this transformation is y equals m times x. If we pick m right, y can actually have this covariance matrix. Okay. And that's a really nice matrix because it is orthogonal. Right? So a lot of the properties of orthogonality come into play here. Um, I guess. Uh, I don't even know why I have the second matrix there. Uh, if we add a constraint and suppose that the spread of the data is equal along all observation axes, we have this. Okay. Um, I guess you could you could transform your data set, right, to, to make the variance the same along each axis. How would you do that? Um, yeah, if you, if you equalize the histograms, you'll force them to take up the full dynamic range for each band. That'll push it closer. Won't necessarily make it true because all the remember all the distributions will have different shapes. Right? All the all the individual histograms might have different shapes. But if you just normalize each of these bands by its 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 variance, you can you know if you divide all the, the values in a particular data set, let's say by their standard deviation. Now what you'll do is you'll normalize that data set so that all the standard deviations are one. Right, so if I take a data set, I have 100 points, I compute their mean, I compute their standard deviation, I divide all those points by their standard deviation, right, I have a new set of data, it's just, it's just a, a, a scalar product, you know, multiplied by that data set. And if I do that for all the bands, and then I recomputed the standard deviation, what would it be in all the bands? It'd be one, because that's what, that, that's what I did, I divided by that standard deviation to begin with. So I could force, that to happen. I could force um, my data set to have a covariance matrix which has um, not, only, not only the fact that it's orthogonal, it has zero in all the uh, off diagonal components and the variances are down the, the major diagonal, but I can force all those variances to be the same if I did normalize that data set. There's, there's times, not so much this quarter, but next quarter when you start to look at some of the hyperspectral processing algorithms with, with uh, uh, John Breckens next quarter, uh, that will force our data set into that, that sort of space. So keep that in mind. Um, all you have to do is it, you wind up just simply uh, taking that data and dividing by the, the variance or the standard deviation of each band on the data. All right, so let's, um, I'm gonna stop there at this point. We're gonna talk about principal components in, like I said, a couple days. And uh, we'll use that as a lead into how we can maybe do better image classification by, by conditioning our data set first. All right. So let me ask you, any 
as a quick review uh, of matrix concepts. Anything that you'd be extremely uncomfortable there doing? I had a question regarding the indices that you had on the covariance matrix. So you had I, K, and L. Yeah, this one here. K, L, and I. Okay. So K is one. K is one band. band. L is the other band. Okay. And then what is I? I is the, okay. So, this is, that'll become clearer a little later, but I'll, mm -hmm. let, let me do it right now, because uh, obviously it's not clear. <laughs> um, K is band, L is band, so band three and band four, band one and band two. I says that we're gonna actually compute, once we start doing this, we're gonna compute a covariance matrix for every land cover type that we might want to classify. All right, so for instance, if I want to break it, if I have a satellite image, and I want to break it up into grasslands, forest, and water. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and select representative samples of grasslands, forest, and water, and I'm going to compute some descriptive statistics for those. I can compute a mean vector. I can compute a covariance matrix. Right? So the I here means you can compute a covariance matrix for an individual So n is the pixels that you have in the N is the number of pixels that I'm going to base those descriptive statistics on. K is one band, L is the other one, and then you have the highest distinct features. That I distinct features that I want to have covariance matrices for. So let's start to talk about classification. All right. Now to, to move into classification, what I want to do is I want to do um, well let's 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 actually move. All right. I'm not sure to, I'm not sure the way I want to approach this with you. So let me let me ask you. Um, who's heard who's heard of a minimum distance to mean classifier. Anybody heard that term? All right. All right, good. All right, so, so that'll be new. So let me, let me ask you, if, if I had a single grayscale image, and I asked you to divide that image up in some way that you were able to define features in that image in the sense of, let's say, land cover. So I took a black and white image out of an aircraft over the RIT campus, and I wanted you to, to do the best job you could at breaking up the individual pixels in that image into a map where certain pixels you said were asphalt, certain pixels you said were concrete, certain pixels you said were black roofing rubber, certain pixels were grass, certain pixels were trees. How would you, how would you even begin to attack that problem? Make a histogram and maybe threshold it. See what the clusters in the histogram are. All right, so so make make a histogram. All right. All right. So I had uh, digital count. Um, and and number. All right, and. My histogram winds up looking like that. Okay. What would you do? So I would try and threshold, like, say that middle peak or whatever. This one here? Yeah, sure. Okay. So threshold it to its kind of right edge and left edge or something, and just see what you get in the left. So kind of pick two two values right there and right there, and, and say if it was in this area, this was. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Right? And maybe if, if I took the values here, that was concrete. And if I took the values 
uh, let's say let's say down here, these were tree. Right? How long do you think that's gonna work? <laughs> You've been in Jeff Pelt's classes too long. <laughs> Um, yeah, dude, but it does. It does very much depend on the band, right? Because in some bands, trees are going to be brighter than concrete. In other bands, concrete will be brighter than trees. Um, it also depends on how many other things in that scene are the same brightness over this integrated wavelength region. This is over the entire visible spectrum. So, in order for this to work, we'd have to have a very, very neat world where all the trees fell in some brightness range of reflectance values. And all the asphalt fell in this range that was produced by you know, the reflectance values of, of that particular feature. But it turns out not to be all that clean. And it turns out to be very hard to try and do classification with a single band. But let's, let's propose doing it for a second. And what if I had this digital count right here? You would classify that as as concrete, All right? Why? And just conceptually, what are you doing there? Well, you're you're saying, okay, well, it fell between the two extremes that I had set out. It fell in this range of digital count values, which is set with concrete. That's that's definitely one way to do it. That is what's going to in the in you know a couple uh, couple minutes here. That's going to be something that we're going to call a parallel type. Head. Right? You're never ever going to use that word anywhere else in your life. Um, but but it's, it's, it says that I'm going to divide my space up into ranges and I'm going to assign, di assign digital counts that fall in those ranges to particular class types. And it's called a parallel type and class one. What's another way to do it? Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, we can go to all the way to Mahalo Novus. Let's, let's, let's not go all the way there yet. But, but let's use the second half of what you just said, distance. All right? If I divided this up, I divided it up for some reason. right? I divided it up because there's little peaks. Right? Well, I might look at this, and I might say, hey, let's compute the mean of concrete. And let's compute the mean of asphalt. And the mean for the tree section. Right? So this is trees, mean for asphalt, and means for concrete. And I could say, all right, well, I have this unknown digital count. How far away am I from the mean of concrete? How far away am I from the mean for asphalt? How far away am I from the mean for trees? Okay. And I could make a, a decision here based on that distance. Logically assign it to the one you're closest to. And that's what we're going to wind up calling the minimum distance to the mean. I love when I don't have to teach anything, it's just obvious from the names, right? I mean, it's just the minimum distance to the mean, that's right. Okay. So let's, let's formalize this a little bit. If if I wanted to come up with a, uh, a, a way of, of, of defining this that I can use over a large range of criteria. So, so what do I mean by that? Um, we just came up with a very simple concept that if I'm a short dis the shortest distance away from one of the means, that's what I'm going to apply it to. Right? That's, that's one criteria I can establish. Um, I could use different measures to figure out how close am I to something. Euclidean distance is a, is a very intuitive one. So what I'd like to do is come up with some formalism uh, to do that. So let me uh, let me pop down here for a sec. And, and, uh, yeah, let's do let's move this one right here. All right. So this is the formalism that I want to establish. I'm going to use this across all the kind of different classifiers that we might want to to utilize. All right, so x, right, is our pixel vector. Right? That's a particular location in our image. And it's a column vector of all the digital counts that are associated with that vector. 
omega sub i is the class that I'd like to assign my pixel to. All right, so in the example that I just gave, we might have a, uh, a satellite image. We might try to break it up into uh, prairie land, forested areas, and water. Right? Omega sub i is just the terminology to represent those three classes. Right? So this is either prairie land, forest, or water. Okay. So that pixel is an element of that class of pixels. Right? If the following is true. If this value g of i of x, right? so g sub i of x, is greater than g sub j of x, right? what are these g's? These g's are what are referred to as discriminant functions. Right? And I could define a whole bunch of discriminant functions. And the discriminant function that I define, um, what I, I wanted to have a property. I want it to be large when I'm likely to be a member of my class. Right? So x is a member of some class when the discriminant function for that class, i in this case, is greater than the discriminant function for all other classes. Right? So when g of i of x, the discriminant function for belonging to prairie land, is higher than g of j of x, the discriminant function for belonging to water and to uh, forest. If that's true, then I want to assign it to prairie land. Okay. So, so this is the formalism that I want to use throughout all of this. Right. So, g of i of x is greater than g of j of x for all j not equal to i. So, if we could, so let's say you were developing a, a software package to do image classification, or you know, any any sort of classification based on the techniques that we're going to be using here. Um, you can write one simple rule that my pixels or my, my data element, right, let's try to make it a little more generic, is going to belong to a particular class of data elements if its discriminant function is greater than all other discriminant functions. And if you want to you know, design your code in a, a, a nice way, well now that would be your only decision rule, that's your if statement. Right? Then you just got to come up with these discriminant functions to make this true. All right, so what would the discriminant function for minimum distance and mean look like? Let me, let me pop back here. All right, so Euclidean distance. Distance between two points, in this case, the point X and the point U. Right, so we're in, in a multispectral space, so these are multidimensional vectors. Right? They each have as many elements as we have bands in our scene. And what, uh, how can I compute that distance? Well, I can compute the dot product between the uh, vector representing our unknown pixel and the vector representing its mean. If I go ahead and I compute that um, dot product, I'll get my distance. So the inner product for this difference matrix will give us that distance. All right, I could expand this out also in matrix form. Um, what do I have? Well, I have uh, the dot product of the unknown vector in itself. I have the dot product of two times the mean vector and the vector, the unknown vector, and I have the dot product of the mean vector in itself. Okay. All right, so in this particular case, with minimum distance to mean or Euclidean distance, we said that we wanted to assign the pixel to the one it was closest to. Right? Now, if I go to the next slide here for a sec, and I look at that discriminant rule that I set up, I wanted to assign it to the one that's greatest. All right. So you might say, why did you define your rule this way? Well, it turns out in a lot of the other cases, of the other uh, metrics that we're going to use, um, we're actually going to assign it to the class that it has the highest probability of belonging to. All right. So I just needed to pick it one way or the other. Um, I just chose to, to select it this uh, particular uh, fashion. All right, now, uh, in that measure that we had on the previous page, uh, the dot product of the unknown pixel with itself, so x dot x, 
right, is common to all the class mean distance terms, right? So if we go back one slide here, uh, this does not depend on the class, right? This is the unknown vector down in with itself. This one depends on the particular class that you're looking at, right? Because you have the, the mean vector for that particular uh, class. And this one obviously depends on the class you're looking at because it's the mean vector dotted with itself. This one would be the same for every class. So we could go ahead and we could drop that from the equation, right? And we can make our discriminant function equal to just the last two terms there. The two times the mean vector dotted with x uh, and subtract from that the mean vector dotted with itself. Okay. Now, with a reversal of a sign, right? Go back. Uh, that was was a plus. This was a minus. Right? This still is small distance, right? If I reverse the sign on that, make this a plus and this a minus. Now all of a sudden this becomes big, right? When they're close, right? And that's exactly what we wanted. So what we did here was we got rid of a, an unneeded computation in the distance computation. Itself. Uh, but we come up with a metric that's still ordered in the same way, all right, and now it'll fit our generic rule. So the minimum distance to the mean, um, you could go through and you could do all these computations and compute the, distance, the actual distance for each um, pixel away from its mean vector, and you could do that in a serial case, you know, go through every pixel and do that. But that's very expensive in the sense that you know, computationally, uh, what do you got to do? Well, you have to take n differences. If you have n bands, you got to take n differences. You got to square each of those differences. You got to sum all those distances together. Then you got to take the square root of that sum, and you'll get Euclidean distance. Okay. Square roots are very expensive, right? Computations to do com in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a machine. Uh, but here, what we've reduced it down to is, is an equivalent metric, but it's very simple to compute, right? This is just um, n products summed together, n products summed together in a subtraction. So there's no square root operations, there's no square operations, which are usually performed as uh, approximations in, in most languages. Um, so all the expensive computations are removed. So do you agree that this would be, give you, everything would stay in the same order? Now this would be largest for things that are closest to the means? Right? It's the same thing, it's the same metric in the end, um, but it can be computed a lot easier. Right? So the formalism for the minimum distance to the mean uh, classifier is just this, what you see right here. X is an element of the class uh, I if this discriminant function is greater than uh, for class I is greater than the discriminant function for all other classes uh, that you're considering. And that's it. All right, so conceptually, you should think about it in a sense of distances. Computationally, much easier way to go ahead. Okay. Make sense? So that's, that's, the, that's the basic. That's the most simple classification algorithm that we can have. What do you have to do in order to make this happen? You have to come up with this descriptive statistic, right? You survive. Right, so for every class that you're interested in, you need to go into your data set. You need to pick some representative number of samples from that data set, right? In this case, pixels, since we're dealing with imagery. So I want to go in and I want to pick 200, 300, prairie land pixels, 500 ocean or water pixels, and you know, you need 400 forest pixels. And then I want to compute the mean for each of those classes. And once I do that, I'm ready to go. That's my whole training. All right, so this mean vector, everybody has a concept of what, what that is? It's just the mean of each of the individual bands um, of the image data set they have. So if you have a 10-band system, like the Landsat 8 that will be coming out soon, um, you'll have 10 el a 10-element vector, the first element being the mean of band 1, the second element being the mean of band 2, and so on. Yes. All right, so this, this concept that we're, we're sort of referring to here, where you go into your data, you pick some representative samples, 
and you compute the descriptive statistics and then go through some decision rule to assign each pixel to a class. Okay? This whole process is what we refer to as supervised classification. Okay? Supervised meaning you have to do some supervision of the algorithm, you have to train the algorithm in some way so that it has the data it needs to perform. Right? Unless we figure out what these means are for each class, this algorithm can't perform. And so we have to go through that training step. And so you'll, you'll usually hear these type of algorithms re referred to in two ways, supervised or trained. Okay. Obviously, there'll be a corollary to these later on, which will be unsupervised and untrained. There's another class of, of classification on how to do that. Does that make sense? Do you, um, do you want to break or do you mind pushing ahead? Monica's going to come in, I think, at around 11.40 or so. Just to introduce the lab. Yeah, why don't you take, why don't you take five minutes? It's looking kind of deep here. <laughs> Let's go back to this illustration for one second. Um, <clears throat> when, we, when I first asked about this, uh, you, you said, hey, let's, let's just um, threshold this up and, and assign pixels that fall, or digital counts that fall within a certain range to, to a class. Well, the minimum distance to the mean isn't really any different than that, right? Because there is going to be some distance between the mean of the asphalt class here and the concrete class here. Well, where is that going to be? It's going to be halfway in between them. Then I'm going to assign it to one or the other. So in other words, if let's see, if I want to pick a, uh, um, a halfway point between the mean of the asphalt class and the mean of the concrete class, it would be somewhere probably right here. Okay. In which case, if I had a pixel here, well, it's going to be closer to this mean than it's going to be that. To this side, it's going to be closer to that. Yep. So in a one-dimensional case, these are just going to be set up as, as single threshold values based on digital count. In a two-dimensional space, what would they look like? And so now, if, uh, if I were to plot not digital count on one axis, but digital count on both axes. Right, so let's say the digital count in band one versus the digital count in band two. Okay. You can sort of think of this as, you know, at least conceptually, I won't draw it here, but imagine you could plot a, a histogram of band one here and a histogram of band two over here, right? And have uh, one coming out this way and one coming out this way. Right? That would sort of represent the, the, the diagram that we just had. Right. But another way of doing that would be to let's form those clusters right, from the training data itself. Remember we said we're going to pick several points and we're going to plot them. Right. If I plot it for asphalt, band one versus band two, asphalt tends to be black, the gray color. Right. So the digital counts will be fairly low and they'll be fairly similar. Right? in band one and band two. I, I don't know what band one and band two are, but it's black, so it's, it's, it's pretty similar at all wavelengths. Right? So if I were to plot all my points for asphalt, I might have data that tends to look like that. Right? So if I pick that many points and I plot it to digital count band one versus the digital count band two, it might look like this. Now, if I went and picked, um, Prairie land, right? Now let's put some meaning on these bands. Let's say this was uh, blue, and this is green. All right. What if I what if I were to plot prairie land? What's prairie land? I don't know what prairie land is. Uh, <laughs> just pick that word out of the air. Now I got to come up with a color for prairie land. Wheat, right? Lots of wheat, so it'll be brownish. All right, so brown tends to be more red than anything else. So it's sort of a reddish green with low blue, right? 
So the green would tend to be high and the blue would tend to be low. Mm -hmm. So my prairie land might come over here. Okay. And water. All right, water. In the blue, tend to be high. In the green, depends on the water. All right? Well, let's say we have a nice, clear body of water. You're overhead, you're, you're in the creek. Imagine you're in the creek. Right? <laughs> you're looking at the water, it looks very blue. And a little tinge of green, too. All right, so it'll tend to be higher in the blue and, and maybe a, you know, a little high in the green. So let's, let's plot that data over here. All right, now. I can come in and I can compute the beam vectors, right? In this case, how many elements would the beam vector have? Two. Two, right? One for each band. So I have a mean here, I have a mean here, and I have a mean here. Okay? Now I, I get an unknown pixel. Falls right there. Minimum distance to the mean says it belongs to which class? The green one here, which was? Asphalt. Asphalt. Of course, green for asphalt. All right. <laughs> All right, so it would belong to the asphalt class. All right, because it was closest. But you can also um, think about this in a different way. Because we have this distance metric, I would be able to form some boundaries in this space. It might look something like this, right? That say, hey, if between these two classes, I'm closer to this one than to this one. And if I'm between these two classes, if I'm closer to this one than to this one, I belong to whichever one I'm closest to. And you'll get these linear features showing up in, in this two-dimensional space. Okay. Well, you can represent that um, you know, formally by taking the difference between your discriminant functions and plotting where in that two-band space, in this case, that equals zero. Right? Because in this, in this diagram, Anywhere along this line, that discriminant function is going to be the same for this class and this class. So I, what would I do? Well, if I subtract those two, it would be zero along that line. So if I found out where those discriminant functions for the particular classes that I have, where the difference between them is equal to zero, I can form these boundaries in two space. I could also, if I went to three dimensions, I can form those boundaries in free space. Those boundaries would be planes in free space, as opposed to lines in two space. And if I went to higher order dimensions, I'd have four dimensional planes, five dimensional planes, and so on. So those hyperplanes come back in in the plane. Right? But they're but they're also they're always linear or, or planar uh, features in this case. Alright. Now Go back to that diagram for a second. Let me, let me play a little bit with the data. So, Libby, you were saying during the break, if you want to classify a particular type of lake, particular water, you'd want to you'd want to pick pixels from that particular type of water. Right? And it might your data might look something like this. What if you wanted to do deep Lake Ontario water and you were very new to this whole classification scheme or game, and when you were training water, you were thinking culturally, right? And you pick some pixels from the Genesee River. Right? They're going to tend to be very different than these. And in fact, they might plot over here. Okay? So now this class looks very different, and the mean would actually be somewhere in the middle. Okay? Now let's exaggerate this a little bit more, which isn't all that unreasonable to do with water. All right, let's say my data was distributed like this. Okay. And let's say, let's say um, the, these values, okay, this was uh, prairie land. Okay. Let's say the prairie land was distributed like this. Okay. Because once you start to look at this data, you're going to realize that it never falls in these nice little clusters like we always draw. It tends to look a lot more messy, and these, these things tend to overlap one another. What happens now when a pixel is here? An unknown pixel is here. Which class do you assign it to? You're going to assign it to the closest mean. Right? That's the way the algorithm works. Could you be wrong? Right? 
And the, the wrong part is what you need to, to start to think about a little bit more. And how can you mitigate how wrong we are? All right, so Euclidean distance, when you think about Euclidean distance, it's just you know the linear path between two points. Um, if I if I go to the univariate, you know, back to a univariate statistical uh, diagram. Right, so let's say I have two distributions. Right? Choose generic x here. So let's say I have that Gaussian distribution, right? and I have this Gaussian distribution, right? and maybe let's have a third. Third, it looks like this. All right. So, if I were to go in here and label things, this would be uh, u for the first distribution. This would be the mean for the second distribution, and that would be the mean for the third distribution. Right. So we have three different distributions, three different means. If I were to use minimum distance to the mean as my class. And I took a pixel that had a value that was right there. Okay. Which mean would I assign it to? One. one, right? It's closest to one. So I make the assignment to number one. All right. Looking at those distributions, do you have any sort of an uneasy feeling that you might be incorrect? And Libby shake his head. And we shake our head. Why? What's that? The, the green and the pink histograms are overlapping. They do it overlap. Could be either one. It could be either one. You're, you're but it's closest away. to the mean and the green one. You're falling outside the. You're further away from the standard, the number of standard deviation from the mean that you calculated statistically. Okay. And so the actual probability that it would exist in that distribution is going to be lower. Yeah. Yeah. So the concept here is that even though my Euclidean distance is smaller, the probability that I might belong to the pink class as opposed to the green class uh, might be higher, which means I should assign it to that one. Now, where did I draw this? I drew it right here. Okay, so which probability is higher? The pink probability is higher than the green. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean it belongs to the pink. It could still belong to the green, but it's more likely to belong to the pink. All right. Now, Libby, you mentioned that it's it's less standard deviations away. Right? So, if you remember your your elementary stats course, you had this thing called z, where you had some unknown value x. You measured how far it was away from its mean, u sub i, and you normalized that distance by the standard deviation a lot. Okay. Now, what is that? Well, this is Euclidean distance. This is a sign Euclidean distance. This is how far away on a number line, or on a straight line, am I away from that mean? Okay. That's what we use for minimum distance in the mean, to classify. If I then go ahead and I divide it by the standard deviation, I get a normalized distance. Okay. I normalize this Euclidean distance by the spread in the data. So if my data is very spread out, like this pink Gaussian distribution is, for an identical Euclidean distance in the numerator, I would get a much large, uh, I'm sorry, a much smaller distance, normalized distance, if I was referring to the pink statistic, as opposed to referring to the green statistics over here. Right? Because um, let's let's you know just break this out for a second. If I if I had x minus mu sub one divided by sigma sub one, that would give me z sub one. And then uh, z sub two would be x same same pixel vector minus mu sub two over sigma sub two. Okay, just you know glancing at what you see here, the standard deviation for one is smaller than standard deviation for two, distribution two. The distance 
to the mean of, of class one, or distribution one, is smaller than the distance from the unknown pixel to the mean of class two, or distribution two. Okay. So depending on the value of sigma, z1 or z2, um, I'd have to compare those two things to one another. And depending on the value of sigma, uh, it might actually reverse the decision that I would have made with Euclidean distance. And in this case, it probably would. Well, it definitely would because the probability is higher. All right, but what I can do is rather than going through and computing probability, I could just go ahead and compute this new distance metric. Right? This new distance metric is just called the z-score. And it's what you always used when you did, you know, comparison of two means from two populations to say if they were the same. And you've done that, you've looked it up in a Z table and, you know, you either rejected the null hypothesis or failed to reject the null hypothesis that the two means were the same. You've done those tests all the time. Um, what I don't know if it was very clear, and hopefully it was, um, was that what you were computing there, the Z, was really just a distance. It's a normalized distance normalized by the spread in your data. Okay, so if you go ahead and use this and this to compute your distances, well, your minimum distance in a mean classifier can take on a whole new meaning here. Right? This is just a distance measure. You're looking for the smallest distance, so if all the rules stay the same, this is still just a minimum distance in a mean classifier, but you're using a new measure of distance. Rather than including distance, you're using normalized Euclidean distance, or the normalization factors to standard deviation. Right. So in univariate space, um, you've done this a whole bunch of times. You may not have used it in this particular way, but you've done this a whole bunch of times. It's just a normalized distance way. It does give you the ability now to take into account not only the mean, which, which Euclidean minimum distance the mean did, but it now takes into account the mean and the standard deviation. So the spread of the data now becomes important. Okay. Now, that's a univariate representation. Okay. In a multivariate space, right, where you have more than one observable, you don't have a mean anymore. You don't have a univariate mean. You have a, a mean vector. You don't have a variance. You have a covariance matrix. Right. So. If I compute my distance in this way, and I'll, I'll use uh, vectors here to represent we're in a multi-dimensional space. So I have an unknown vector x, and I subtract from that unknown vector x the mean of class i. Right? And then I have, I'll just, I'm going to write it over here. I have that unknown vector minus the mean of class I, and I put in the middle here the covariance matrix for the class I. So this goes back to your question earlier um, about what was that extra subscript we have in the covariance matrix. This is the covariance matrix for that class I. And I take the inverse of that. Right? So now what do I have here? Uh, let me let me fix everything up here. I'm going to put a transpose on there too. All right, all right. So now, what do I have? Well, in a vector sense, I have my squared z squared. All right. So let's look at this for a second. Distance away from the mean times the distance away from the mean. So I take the transpose of that vector. This is a an n by one vector. This is a, I'm sorry, a one by n vector. This is an n by one vector over here. I get out a, a dot product or a scalar. And so the products of the outer terms here essentially is a scalar, which is a squared um, dot product of that, that particular uh, difference vector. And by taking the inverse of the covariance matrix, well, if you, if you think about you know, how you used inverses back in, in third grade, that was just to represent what was in the denominator, right? So that's the equivalent of putting your variance down here in the denominator. So I have my distance over my standard deviation, right, squared. 
something. So if I technically wanted to make these two things the same, this univariate z-score, I would just square the top and the bottom of that. Now I have the equivalent of what I have in multidimensional space. Okay. So this is the squared z-score. This is the squared multivariate z-score. Let's just call that d. Because right. it represents what? It represents a normalized distance. And a normalized distance in n space between a vector, an unknown vector, and its mean, normalized by its covariance matrix. Right. Um, I mentioned earlier that this does have a name. This is called the Mahalanobis distance. I'm not sure to spell. I think that's an A. All right, so the Mahalanobis distance is just the equivalent of the univariate z-score squared in multidimensional space. Okay. So exactly that same concept. So in n space, we could form that same diagram that we had before for the minimum distance to the mean class bar where we drew those lines. Right. This one, um, for the Mahalanobis distance, will uh, tend not to be linear, in its, in its definition because it's a square term. What we'll actually have in the n space now is um, hyperlipsoids that set up to form these, these distances. So if I were to draw it in two space, the, uh, does everybody have it? Can I write that? Um, if I were to draw this in just two space, again, you know, going back to the the uh, digital count in band one versus the digital count in band two scenario that we had before. Um, I, I have these distributions of points like we had before. Okay, And if I computed my decision boundaries, what I would do is in two space here, I would have an ellipsoidal boundary because of its quadratic nature, I'd have an ellipsoid that forms around that data set. Around my other data set up here, I'd have another ellipsoid that might form to encompass that data. The axes of these ellipsoids that form are going to be proportional to the spread of the data in those directions. So my decision boundaries will no longer be linear, they'll be quadratic in nature. But essentially, the same thing's going to happen. If I have an unknown pixel there, which one does it belong to? Well now, you're going to compute the multidimensional equivalent of a z-score that is going to represent the distance between this unknown point and that mean, and this unknown point and this mean. The way I've drawn this, this is going to be a pretty difficult decision. And it's going to be right in the boundary. But if I had uh, this data set over here, the weird lag behind. All right, and I was to form the hyperlipsoid around that. and its mean was over here, and I have this distance to consider. So, if you had to guess which one was that closest to, which would it be? All right, so let me ask you, what are those ellipsoids that I've drawn? What are they proportional to? Right, it's the variance, right? So, let's say this represented a the equivalent of a one sigma decision. You'd have to determine how many sigmas away am I. So since this one is the biggest, right, this distance here, you know, let's, let's assume that we're the same distance away from each of these boundaries where I have this drawn. Which one is it closer to? If I'm the same Euclidean distance away from each of the boundaries, 
a number of multivariate standard deviations, which one am I closest to? Probably the blue one. And if the Euclidean distance is the same in all directions to each of these boundaries, the, uh, this is probably, I don't know, 1.2 multivariate standard deviations away. This is maybe 1.4, and this one's maybe 1 1.4. So you'd be closest to the blue one. The truth is, it probably doesn't belong to any of them. It probably belongs to something else that you have to pick. But if those are the only three you pick and you wanted to assign something to everything, that would be the choice you might have. Does that make sense? So conceptually, we're, we're, we're there. I mean, that's the concept that we're going to apply. Now, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and, and go through the, the derivation of, of this particular metric. Right? So what we've been talking about so far, this multivariate z-score, the Mahalanobis distance, um, that is a simple distance metric. Right? We can look at it that way. But there's a lot of things that come into play. Right. So let me let me ask you this. If I had a steam that was 80% water, 10% prairie land, and 10% forest, let's go with the same three classes that we've had. If I gave you nothing, no information, didn't even show you the image, and I said that it was 80% water, 10% prairie land, and 10% uh, forest. And I said, here's an unknown pixel. I threw you that unknown pixel. And I asked you to put it in a into a class. Which class would you put it into? Water. Those are good odds to take in Las Vegas, right? That would be your guess. That would be the best guess you could make. Well, that's important information. If 80% of my scene is water, and I had a situation like this that I have drawn here, a science of water is probably going to be a very good guess. If, if the Mahalanobis distance came out the same for all three of those, right? so let's say at that point the Mahalanobis distance was the same, exactly the same for all three. Now, you're, now you have no idea where to assign it. But if you knew that 80% of the pixels in the scene were water, you'd have a pretty good uh, or a pretty easy time making your decision where you assign it. So bringing that information, which is something that we know about the scene before we do anything else, and that's called a priori, Information. A priori. <laughs> well, what else? A priori. Beforehand knowledge of, of the scene. Um, you would go ahead and, and use that information somehow. So I'd like to pull that in. Now, there's also something else that, that may be a little more subtle. And if you look at those these distributions that we have right here, um, If I asked you, if you looked at this data, and I asked you the question, do you think the person who picked the training data that these distributions came from, do you think they did a good job? What would you say? Well, <clears throat> from this, maybe not. <laughs> right, because you know those points look like they might be evenly distributed all over the place. And, and, uh, but what if what if I had let me let me modify this a little bit. What if I had a lot more points over here? Yeah, so maybe you get some kind of weird outlier in that bottom left part of that ellipse. Yeah, so over here, maybe there's some outliers here that really don't belong to what should really be the class, which is over here. Okay, how is that going to change the, the descriptive statistics? It's going to cost on more things water than maybe on the edge, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's because this distribution, this line, is further out than it should be, which is a factor of the, the variance, right? Or the covariance matrix in this case. So your covariance matrix tended to be a little bit too large, right? So because it's a little bit too large, maybe I should penalize that distance. Right? Because this thing's so big, it makes this look like it should belong over here. But when you look at this, 
and you see this high concentration here and a smaller concentration over here and this artificially enlarged variance or spread of your data, maybe you should look at that and say, maybe I should penalize myself in some way. And say, you know what, even though it is closer here, I'm not really sure that all that variance is part of a, a, a real class that I'm interested in. All right, so, so we're gonna look at the covariance matrix and use it in a way that we might penalize ourselves, right? For being, hey, you know, that covariance matrix is just way too big. So because it's so big, maybe we should not use, you know, all this, or maybe we shouldn't rely on this, this is as heavily as, as we might, right? If we, if we did pick a good data set. So keep those, those two other things in mind. There's the Mahalanobis distance, how far am I away from the mean normalized by the spreading data. There's the a priori knowledge of how many pixels in the scene belong to what class. That should be important. And there's this concept of your, your, your um, spread, your measure of spread, being artificially too large because the data that you selected may have not been exactly a good representative sample for your data set. Right? And that should penalize your decision. Right, so we'll pull all those three things together uh, next time into what's going to be called a, a GML or a Gaussian maximum likelihood classifier. Right? It, it, GML is different from a Holonobis distance because it takes into account those, those penalty functions. Cool. Any questions? So Monica stuck in on the left. Second labs, you're done. Make sure the, the rubric's like underneath your report, so she got both books. Um, just a couple things in the second lab, real quick. Two things that were kind of common um, it's just keeping straight the difference between irradiance and radiance. So, irradiance is watts per meter squared. There's no dependence on angle, and radiance is watts per meter squared per radiance, so there is a dependence on angle. There was some confusion, I think, because you had to generate, you had to come up with those two final numbers, and in the first one, you were doing an integral that included radiance, but you were still ending up with radiance because you were integrating over the wavelength, so you were integrating out the spectral dependency. In the second one, you were actually integrating over angle, so you should have ended up with irradiance. You should have ended up with watts per meter squared. Um, and a lot of people ended up with or reported a radiance value. So I don't know if that was just an error in units or some confusion with the integration. But also with the second integration, um, a lot of people, so it was over sigma and phi or theta and phi. People called the zenith angle different things, but most people called the azimuth angle phi. And a lot of people tried to pull the phi out of the integral because there wasn't one in the equation because it was radiance sine, theta, cos theta, d theta, d theta. You can't pull that out of the integral because the radiance value still depends on it. So the radiance wasn't the same for all of the azimuth angles at a single zenith angle. It still changed as you went around, so you need to leave that in there. So it should have just become a basic numerical integration. So you should have just had a sum of the radiance times the sine theta, cos theta, and then the d theta, d phi in the integral just became delta theta and delta phi. So if it was, I think it was 15 degrees and 30 degrees, mm -hmm. So you should have just converted those to radians and actually multiplied by them because they'd be less than one and it'd be summing up the fractional values. So um, I, I made some comments on some people's, but if that's still confusing, once you look at that, just, just come see me about it. That seemed to be something that was kind of confusing. Um, so this is the handout for the third lab. Um, there isn't like a, a whole lot to go over as far as assigning this one. The couple things to note, the introduction and the background and the report are going to be really, really important because a lot of the actual lab is just finding and hitting buttons in Envy. And so illustrating that you know what those buttons are doing is going to be really important. So that should be in the introduction and in the background I and mean, a little bit in the discussion too. But just really make sure that you like are describing the results and what you're getting. And there isn't a whole lot in the handout about where to find things in Envy exactly. So it doesn't tell you like click this button and click this button. So you're gonna need to look at the help a little bit. Um, you know, just just Google something, Google classification editing, and find the help and see like where the different buttons are and stuff like that. 
Um, obviously, if you can't find something, like come see me. But it's more just kind of exploring like where the different things are, so you can get familiar with them and understand. It is pretty intuitive. There's like a classification tab, so you know, look in there, and then you know, there's post processing. So that's probably where your evaluation techniques are and stuff like that. So just um, play around with that a little bit. And there are going to be three different classifications. So that part's pretty straightforward. The confusing part is that the evaluation of each classification, there's going to be five different confusion matrices. We have none of those. OK. So none of this is really going to make a whole lot of sense until you go over it. But the bottom line is that it's going to be really, really important to keep track of how you're selecting your data. So you're going to select these things called ROIs, or region of interest. And you're going to select different sets of them. So naming your data in MD is going to be really important. So know which ones you selected for which part of the lab and what they correspond to. So These are the representative samples we were just talking about. Um, region, you're, you'll define a region of interest you know, to identify pixels that are prairie land and water and, and so on. Yeah. So it'll make more sense once you start going through it, but it's going to be really tempting to just start at the beginning and you know, go to step one in the procedure and then just step through. When you get to the third one, you're going to pick ROIs and just name it like ROI1 or something, you know. And by the end, you're going to have like 15 different ones that are going to be really hard to keep track of. So just, I suggest reading all the way through and understanding what you're trying to achieve before you start, because it's just going to be a lot of different, pulling a lot of different pieces together. And then the second thing is just um, make sure you really look at the rubric. These, as you can see, there are a lot of little things to include. So like I said, there's three different classifications. And then for each one, there's different things. So you can see here, there's one, two, three, four, five different confusion matrices. So in this case, like the rubric is really, really helpful in indicating what you need to include. So just make sure you step through that so you don't leave off like a table or something like that. So um, yeah, the basic concepts aren't too bad. It's more just kind of exploring and ending, but keeping track of your data is going to be the most confusing part, so just use the handout to make sure that you've done all the different steps or that you've looked through. So it should be easy um, to see all the different pieces that you need to include. Um, yeah, and by the end of class on Thursday, you'll have about 95% of what you need uh, for background information. It's kind of hard to like talk about it without actually learning about it, so you can kind of read through it maybe before class, you know, kind of like you're looking for different things and stuff like that, but um, yeah, there isn't, it isn't as much that needs to be explained as far as how to do it. It's a lot more than exploring how to find things in NV and stuff like that, and getting familiar with it, so. And probably probably on Thursday also I'll pop up NV to, to show you some interactive examples of, of what we're doing, so you'll, you'll see a lot of it there. It's pretty straightforward, just more data handling. And this the difference here too is that this is um, real data and like new software. So you're all gonna get different results and that's fine. But it'll be like as you can see like the image isn't perfect, your ROIs aren't gonna be perfect. So the Modran lab was a little bit more set up so that you know you run something and you should all get the same because it's kind of a setup exercise where this is more like a real image so it's a little bit more realistic and it's gonna be hard to deal with the data and keeping track of it. So the data here is from Missy. Missy is a sensor that we built here in-house. Um, eight circles? How many, how many circles? Uh, no, well, there's only like 25 or 26 included in this image. In this one, okay. Yeah, I don't know how many there are total. So this is just the visible portion? Yeah. Okay. And then you should eliminate some that are misregistered. So you should end up processing with about 22 bands. That's all. Yeah, so this covers the 400 to 700 nanometer region, hyperspectral, every, not only every 10 uh, nanometers, uh, but some of the bands are, are bad. Yeah, so the image doesn't look great as it is because it's, uh, what do they call it, a level one, so the geometric correction hasn't been applied, so it's kind of. It's a line scanner, and none of the wiggles have been removed. So when you look at the data, you know, it, it, nothing's going to look straight in there, it's yeah. just because it hasn't it kind of looks like someone took it and like stretched it out or something like that. But if you go through the bands, you'll notice that a couple of them are like particularly bad. Like they don't even line up with the other bands, and those are the ones you're going to want to pull out for your spectral subset. Any questions? I know ignore, right? What is it? Ignore. Ignore. So when you compute your 
or when NV will go ahead and compute your mean vector and your covariance matrix, the fact that the original data set, let's say, has 28 bands and only 22 of them are good, your mean vector should only be 22 elements long, not 28. Because if you include the data in those bad bands, it doesn't add any information directly applicable to your task, right? They'll tend to, they're very noisy. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, these images, if you look through, you'll see some images that are just extremely noisy. And you realize that if you add noise in and as something that you're trying to make a decision based on, it shouldn't contribute at all. In fact, it might confuse things. So those kind of things you want to tend to remove before you start your process. And it do let you select, like you said, a, a, a fan subset. Yeah, almost every time you do that, there's like a spectral subset option, or you can just create what they call a bad bands list and apply that to every analysis that you do. Any questions?